Ens començarem introduint el Chris. Chris, thank you for being here. Uh, Chris was yesterday uh, really very briefly and very good introduced by Paul Walder in the uh, CCB, CCB presentation. But I think that for those who could have come and who, well, I think I'm seeing that almost everyone must know here uh, Chris Salter, but even so I'm going to do this short uh, presentation. Chris Salter is an artist and researcher. It's based in Montreal. Uh, he lives as well in part, partly in Berlin. Uh, he studied economy, economics and philosophy at Emory University and received his, uh, his PhD in theater directing and criticism and in computer generated sound and at, at Stan, uh, Stanford University. Um, his artistic and research interests revolve around the development and production of responsible, uh, responsive performance environments fusing space, sound, image, architectural material, and sensor-based technologies. I think uh, subjectivity, performativity, as well as interaction with other disciplinary fields of arts are other main aspects and features of his works. Uh, he is researcher and professor in the Concordia University. Uh, since 2011, he is director of Hexagram Concordia Center for Research and Creation in Media Arts, which is described in the website as a transdisciplinary nexus for researcher creators. I think it's quite interesting, the idea of researcher creators, not researcher of artists and researchers. So maybe afterwards we can talk a bit about this mm -hmm. uh, difference which with, between creators, researcher creators and artists. And um, he's, um, he was also guest professor at the Kunsthochschule für Medien in, Köl in Köl Cologne, uh, in the master program in, in the media arts history of uh, Institute of Bildwissenschaften in, Don in the Donau University in, in Austria, and his artistic uh, and research projects had been had turned, has been presented at the major venues, so like the Venice Biennale, National Art Museum of China in Beijing, Laboral Centro de Arte in Gijón, Vitra Design Museum in Germany, Ars Electronica, Villette Numerique in Paris, Transmediale Exit Festival, uh, Place des Arts, Electra, Shanghai, uh, Yerba Buena in San Francisco, Banff Center, V2, CCGraph, Media Terra, so everywhere <laughs> has been presented. So I think that sets a real luxus. So it's, I think it's almost a miracle that you're here. <laughs> so, so thank you very much for being here again. Uh, in addition to his artistic work, he, Chris Salter is the author of numerous publications in the areas of technology and performance, real-time responsible um, environments, mobile real-time real media, and cultural politi politics. And he published a book in 2010 uh, named en Entangled Technology and Transformation of Performance uh, by MIT. And today he will focus, yesterday he was focusing his presentation around more his artistic works. Today his presentation is going to be focused in his new coming book, uh, Alien Agency, Ethnography, Technoscience, and Performance of the Non-Human, uh, which I think is going to be published in February. Okay. So, um, thank you. I'm finished here. I think it's your turn. Thank you. Super. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tira. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, I just got off a plane yesterday and slept straight for eight hours, so now I'm ready to go. Um, uh, buenos dias, uh, muchas gracias, Paul and, and uh, Victor and Daniel for the invitation to speak here uh, at Art Matters. So uh, I, was, I was asked to talk about the relationship between different theoretical and methodological approaches to artistic research that are aligned around the, the theme of new materialism, although as most of you know, the new materialism is actually quite old materialism. Um, uh, as well as uh, actor network theory uh, or other kind of post-humanist, sorry, uh, STS perspectives. Um, and, and Paul knows that this is a, a topic that I've been occupied with for a, a long time. Uh, so I yeah, just finished this new book, which is out in February. We actually launch it, if anyone's in Berlin, uh, on January 30th at uh, Transmedia and CTM. Um, and it's called Alien Agency. Uh, now I've changed the subtitle. It's called Experimental Encounters with Art in the Making because MIT thought that stuff with technoscience and non-human was too weird. Um, so, uh, and Andy Pickering, uh, who some of you know, wrote the afterword. So what, what the book tries to do is very much focus on this topic of this conference, which is 
answer the question that research always tries to answer, which is how does original thought or new forms of knowledge or actually new things come in the world and what do they actually do to the world? Um, so the Alien Agency focuses on three different kind of stories of art in the making. Um, it describes these three works or, or practices that propose a really different version of the world, one which is dynamic, temporally emergent, contingent, and performative. And there's two intertwined questions that drive through the book. The first is theoretical, which is how do humans and media co-produce each other um, in the act of making things? So be, be, with that question, I try to provide an account of how different kinds of materials and the three types of materials that are focused on in the book are, are sound, biological stuff, which I'll talk about today, and sensory inputs, for instance, like molecules that our senses then interpret as smells or tastes, or things like light, which of course are photons that hit the eye, or waves that are sound that hit, hit the ear, or also the skin. Uh, and how are those materials used in, in what I'm going to call kind of techno-scientifically driven art practice that, that go beyond our human intent? So the classic story of artists, of course, is artists are in control. Um, you know, they have an idea, and then it's realized somehow in the world in some kind of material, and then it's put out on display uh, without any regard to the fact that the material itself is very much part of the artistic practice um, and a lot of times actually thwarts or makes the artistic practice fail because one tries to assume that one can control the material. Um, then, of course, there's expertise, which is more, the more expert you are, the more you can control things. But as you know, for those of you who make things, even expertise always leads itself to dead ends and, and interesting uh, turns in the road. So there's no such thing as a kind of teleologically based thing that's in your head and then goes out in the world. It, 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 when, when you make something, the world rushes in and bothers you and, and transforms that process of making. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how that works today. Um, so <clears throat> the second question is a methodological question. So if we have a theoretical question about how humans and media are co-produced, the methodological question is how do you actually write about this kind of practice, right? So some of you who are writing PhDs in artistic research or art research, or I'll talk about research creation, which is, a, it is actually a bit different term than it's used in Europe. Um, everybody knows that you're probably struggling to figure out, well, how do I actually write about this in a, in a scholarly way, right? Because there's still a tension uh, in the academy and also in the cultural world about art and research. And, and those things somehow keeps being blurred together, but actually they're quite separate. They can feed on each other, but they're not necessarily the same as some people want to make them out to be. <clears throat> so what I've tried to do is provide a kind of template for, for depicting how these research-based artistic practices in the making might actually be useful for others who are grappling with similar issues. And everywhere I go, there are students and other researchers coming to me asking me <laughs> the same question. Well, how do, you, how do you write about this kind of thing? So I, I take a little uh, cue from, from our friend Bruno Latour, who wrote in Science in Action about the idea of science in the making rather than re ready-made science. Um, so, and along the way in this account, I actually try to derail these anthropocentric-centered worldviews while wrestling with the agency of, of media and technologies while you make things. So it's a kind of story from the trenches, one might say, um, the studio or the laboratory or the black box or even the street. So what, what this alien agency, both the book but also the kind of term, uh, tries to tell is how to artistic works come to be. Now, that's an ontogenetic question in the sense of it's not what it is, it's how it comes, how it is, or how it comes to be over time. Um, and the, the three projects I talk about are based on ethnographic field work that I did between 2010 and 2013 uh, all across um, Europe, North America, and Australia. And as I said, each, each story is organized around a particular kind of material, sound, tissue culture, and sensorial matter. Um, and each of the, these stories asks a specific question. So the first question is, how do you record the unrecordable experience of sense and affect in the sound of urban breathing, in the acoustic life of the city? 
The second question is how do you grow and keep alive muscle cells that move and move by themselves outside of a body? That's what I'm gonna talk about today. And the third is how do you generate light environments uh, of different kind of sensory materials, light, vibration, sound, smell, taste molecules, in which you can experience other ways of sensing, other cultural frameworks of sensing. Um, but so those are these kinds of three, three stories. They're, they're ethnographic, but they're also autoethnographic in the sense that they not only tell a kind of participant observer story of the, the, the researcher, myself, sitting back and, and looking at these processes, but in fact, they also tell an observant participant, per, participant story, which is I'm the participant, but I'm also observing the process by which these things come to be. But there's a larger kind of question that links all the stories together, and, and it's this question. It's how is it that, that artists or researcher creators organize the conditions for certain, these kinds of experimental assemblages to form and catalyze other ways of knowing and being in the world. And, and these kinds of assemblages that the artists I look at are doing um, very much kind of sidestep these old philosophical dichotomies that we're still struggling with between subjects and objects, human and non-human, inert and live, mind and body, and knowing and experiencing. And those, of course, are still predominant philosophical paradigms of, of, of Western philosophy that, that I think a lot of artists just, just kind of don't care about um, because the proof of the pudding is in the eating. It's, it's what one's making and, and how those types of works propose other ways of looking at the world, experiencing the world. Now, there's something odd about all of this, and it's the fact that it, how does something at a distance, and you make something and you put it out there, and this, this thing at a distance at a remove that's beyond us, it's not even human, how can something like that exert such a powerful set of effects and, and affects on, on us, on our bodies, on the soul, and actually in, in the world? Um, these experiences sometimes are hard to render in words. And the question doesn't come out of anywhere. It's, as everybody knows, this is situated in a larger, almost kind of seismic shift, which is taking place now in the humanities, in the social sciences, uh, in art and design, um, across different sites, the university, the museum, the festival, the scientific laboratory. And it's, it's a question being asked by a number of disciplines, by anthropologists, by human geographers, by science study scholars, um, by historians, ecologists, political activists, scientists, or artists and scientists and designers. Um, and it's, it's the question of how to throw off the human-centric, human exceptionalist worldview and turn toward the actions and behaviors of non-human things, processes, objects, or stuff, or forces. So vibrancy, agency, material vitalism, matter flows of human, non-human bodies and things is a kind of new lingua franca that replaces such worn out words as discourse, textuality, language, and meaning. In this new world, scallops and data, electrical power grids and microbial dust, the weather and machines have become our objects of analysis and production. We're busy unearthing and peering into these hidden powers and forces, anxious to bestow on them responsibility and agency, no longer inert the stuff of the world behaves and performs beyond us. And if you look at the scholarly landscape, you know immediately what I'm talking about. That, there's the evidence right there. So Bruno Latour asks who speaks for the non-humans. Feminist scholar Karen Barad argues for a kind of, she calls post-human performativity of matter. <clears throat> Andrew Pickering speaks of an ontological theater or performative ontology. Uh, Jane Bennett describes vital materiality and the force of things. This goes on and on, and I'm just mentioning a few. Now, anthropologists, so I was just at the AAA, the American Anthropological Association Conference in D.C. last weekend where Mr. Latour spoke, once again saying the same thing he's been saying for 10 years, which is uh, geologists have handed anthropologists the age of the Anthropocene, and they should try to deal with it, even though they, it may be a gift to them, even though it's probably a poisoned gift, as Latour said. Um, so you'd think that anthropologists who, of course, we thought were interested in human-driven culture, well, now they're also speaking of other kinds of cultures, what's called multi-species ethnography. So they're focusing on living water, fungi, bacteria, and you name it. And even the natural sciences, which, as we think, are still objective, they have also gotten into this act. In 2008, as many of you know, uh, Nature devoted entire issue to the microbiome 
quote, who are we? The we refers to the wild profusion of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that colonize the human body. These unseen passengers tr number in the trillions. So who is the human here? This is in us, but if there are trillions of bacteria, can we say we're actually human? Now, um, <clears throat> that's of course the scholarly domain, and as I said, it goes on across many different fields, but even the arts have gotten into this non-human uh, rush. So if anyone attended the last documenta, uh, Carolyn Christoph Barkiev, the, the artistic director and chief curator, waxed in her curatorial statement the following, quote, Documenta 13 is dedicated to artistic research, whatever that is, and forms of imagination that explore commitment, matter, things, embodiment, and active living in connection with, yet not subordinated to theory, driven by a holistic and non-logocentric vision that is skeptical of the persistent belief in economic growth. This vision is shared with and re recognizes the shapes and practices of knowing of all the animate and inanimate makers of the world, including people, unquote. So at the same time as everybody knows here in this room, you know, uh, the, 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 the media art or the digital art world, but also the visual art world, you know, and of course those are two separate spaces that are continually trying to meet. Um, they're also dealing more and more with projects that challenge these kinds of established sensorial, ecological, or biological borders. So for instance, in any museum, you might encounter tissue cultured sculptures, the dynamics of ferrofluids or light particles or hydrogenated bubbles, lasers that animate emissions from power plants, uh, grown furniture made of fungi or quivering architectures made of gelatin or cymatic phenomena or machines that's, that shit um, or theatrical performances of consisting of lights and fog that have no human body near them. So um, that's just a, a take of, of some kinds of works that you're going to increasingly encounter in cultural centers. Now, I describe these strange contexts and works um, for a very specific reason, and that lies at the crux of this book. And the question is really, you can think about these questions of materiality and agency and vibrancy through texts and the words, um, but you also need to think about them in a lived bodily encounter with the material rush and torrent of the world. And that is the encounter that artistic practice is actually constituted of. So what would it mean to think of these really high stake questions of agency and materiality from the point of view of actually making those kinds of things? Um, and what we term in research creation, I'll talk about that word in a second, um, this, this getting away from the split between mind and body, epistemology and ontology, humans and non-humans, and, and, and blurring those and messing them up. And what I want to claim is that I think artists and, uh, and designers who are, who are making things, and, and this is not that you can say, well, texts are making things too, but there's something different about a material action that is actually a very different claim uh, than other disciplines that are interested in these materiality questions are, are asking. Um, these, this, in a way, artists or designers making things are not just another discursive contributor to the debate. They actually enact and perform these worlds that are discussed, right? So it's not about just describing them. I mean, that's a classic definition of performance or performativity. Uh, it's not just the description of the act. It actually enacts it. It actually brings it into being. Um, so th that's really important to understand. I think there's a substantially different, it's not better or worse, it's not a value judgment, it's just a different claim of how I think artists are dealing with these questions uh, other, uh, over uh, soci sociologists, anthropologists, uh, or, or philosophers. <clears throat> now, the book, the book also looks at this question of technoscience. I'm sure we've heard that yesterday. Uh, this term, technoscience, is actually very important because I go to a lot of conferences and discussions about technology and art and science, and um, everyone's always talking about art and science, right? But, but in fact, most artistic practices are focused on technoscience, and, and this term comes not from Bruno Latour or Isabel Stengers, but it actually comes from Gilbert Hertois, who's a Belgian sociologist of science. 
And he defined this term technoscience to describe scientific practices that are directly intertwined in a technological setting and that are technologically driven. Quote, contemporary scientific research in which technology, which is the space and the time surrounding us, is the natural milieu of development as well as the prime mover. In other words, technology and scientific practice and artistic practice is seen both as a medium, as a milieu, and a driving force in its development. So I bring this up because I want to shift away from talking about art and science, which I really don't like. And I don't like the term digital art, <clears throat> but I find that art and, tech and, art and techno science are actually capture very much the move that um, artists, but also those in, in science and technology studies have made for a long time, which is to recognize somehow that technology in many artistic practices is both the context, context, the content, the form of circulation, and the form of distribution in which these things arise. Okay, so what I'm going to do um, for the next uh, 20 minutes is focus on this one project in the book in particular that focuses on, uh, on, on art and bio, uh, bioscience. And it's this very weird... Uh, conceptually, technically, and organizationally difficult project that I've been doing with, uh, with Symbiotica um, in uh, the University of Western Australia. It's actually a project from, from Yunan Zur, who's the co-founder, uh, well, actually not the co-founder of Symbiotica, but, but the, the co-director and runs the academic program along with, with Orrin Katz, as most of you know. And the project is called Tissue Engineered Muscle Actuators, T-E-M-A. And um, it's going to premiere next October uh, as part of the Neo Life Conference that Symbiotica will run, which is for the Society for Literature, Science, and the Arts, the first conference of the SLSA outside of North America or Europe. To give you a bit of a context, um, and it'll be in the Curtin uh, Art Gallery in Curtin University, um, give you a bit of a context. So the, the, the project involves uh, the creation of a hybrid, or some of you know the term semi-living, that's the term that Oren and Enoch coined to talk about these tissue-cultured entities. Um, it's a kind of li semi-living machine that tries to explore those kind of borders between life and non-life machine and organism. And the machine consists of a bundle of tissue-cultured skeletal mouse muscle cells from the C2, C12 cell line that are grown and organized within a technological environment which we call a bioreactor, which is bioreactor is simply a kind of incubation device that keeps these cells alive because, of course, cells need uh, get constant gas exchange, uh, fluid, uh, you know, or need to be fed and need also um, a warm environment so that the bioreactor uh, enables those things to happen. Um, now, uh, most bioreactors just keep cells alive, but this actually senses the movement of these cells. We sense the force and displacement, which is strain in physics, of these contractions of these very tiny engineered muscle cells. And then we try to um, take that and map those movements into the scale of human perception in terms of vibration and light within the exhibition environment. Um, so uh, what we try to very much not to do is to represent these cells through the instruments of scientific visualization, which is what you usually see. Ah, if I see it, it must be there, right? So truth telling is in the visual instrument, but in fact, we're trying to say the opposite, is that the truth telling might not even be in the, it, it may be, be between the instrument and the body of the perceiver and the entity in the in the bioreactor. Um, so I'm going to read you a couple of excerpts of this because uh, you'll get a sense of the way uh, I describe this project. Because uh, as I was saying, I was I was working both as a as an artist and working as an artist in the project, but also as an ethnographer. In fact, I originally approached Orrin Katz and said I wanted to do ethno ethnographic work on the project that, that Enoch described to me. And then he said, well, only if you can work with us making it. So I said, sure, why not? That sounds good, because I don't do anything with biology. Most of my work involves um, dead stuff like light and sound. Um, so um, I'm trying to describe the, the term that Andy Pickering uses, material agency, which is a controversial but actually useful term. And that's the behavior or action of something, of a thing, right, or beyond us, and the way that artists deal with that question. So I want you to keep two things in mind as I talk. The first is um, the following question. Do these ontological pronouncements of non-humans and their agency hold up in practice? In other words, 
it's all well and good to talk about like speculative realism or object-oriented ontology or object-oriented philosophy or whatever you want to call it. It's good to t it's 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 all well and good to talk about objects withdrawing from us and a correlation that we define the world based on uh, you know our human relationship to the to things in the world. And there's another thing to actually see if it's manifested at the bench, if you're actually dealing with those questions and do they influence the way you make something. And the second question is of a bigger Pandora's box that I'm going to open up, which is uh, techno science, art, and research. And these terms, as you know, are really entangled in a really complex mix of social, cultural, technical, uh, and economic agendas. And the term research is in the academy uh, deals, it keeps going back and forth between practice based or artistic research or practice led research, that's the UK term for it, uh, artistic research in Germany and the Netherlands or Sweden or Switzerland, uh, research creation in Canada. And research creation in Canada is very interesting because um, this is what Hexagram, and I invite you all to look at hexagram.ca to see what Hexagram is doing. Hexagram is a very large network and it has two university. Um, antennas, Concordia, where I teach, which is English, and then UCAM, University of Becamalia, which is French. Uh, and it brings together 100 researchers for not only fine arts and design, but also anthropology, sociology, computer science, uh, philosophy, cultural studies, um, um, and a number of other fields. Um, and research creation is defined as a kind of intertwinement between material and discursive knowledge. So in other words, it's not saying that I make art, therefore I make research. It says art is an outcome of a research process or a question. This is very much how the humanities and social sciences define research in general, right? It's the book is the outcome. The book is not the research. It's the outcome of the process of research, which is you have a question and you try to understand um, what the implications of that question are in a field, right? So um, now research is a pretty complicated word. Uh, the standard definition of research is the following, quote, research signifies new knowledge that coherently and systematically advances a field, is grounded and supported by established methods. That is the way you do something. That's all that method is, is how you do something. Um, and it's validated by social frameworks, i.e. peers, and already existing bodies of knowledge, models, and paradigms. The already existing is the most important part. In other words, there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. Um, and the Polish immunologist Ludwig Fleck in the 1920s, when he talked about the idea of thought collectives, he basically said that science is a social practice. It's not an individual activity. And by the time you come up with an idea and it circulates in the community of peers, the social collective in which you operate in, and returns to you, it's unrecognizable. It's no longer yours because it's been validated by the set of peers. Now, this is a long story, as some of you know, in the philosophy and history of science, the way that science is a socially shaped activity rather than a kind of thing which is somehow independent of humans or instruments that's waiting to be discovered in nature. Now, unlike science in German Wissenschaft, uh, which is literally knowledge making or knowledge hood. Uh, uh, research is actually a pretty recent phenomenon. It's actually is only as old as the late 19th century when Wilhelm von Helmboldt uh, at the University of Berlin defined essentially the contemporary notion of research, right? Which is uh, pursuing scientific knowledge within a bureaucratized and institutionalized setting. So the research laboratory comes from that period because before that, most scientists were doing independent work. Uh, they weren't working in organized um, structures. Um, now, this question of research brings up a bunch of other questions, right, which is how does art then align with research? How does art produce knowledge? If we're asking, saying research produces knowledge, what, what does art making do? And if not, then what does it do? The second is how is it to be evaluated and compared to other knowledge making disciplines that usually disseminate knowledge through language and text? The third is what is unique in comparison to the kind of knowledge that's produced in artistic practice versus the kind of knowledge produced by the humanities of the social sciences or indeed the sciences. How are students to be mentored? This is a huge question that drives research creation in Canada and does not really drive research creation in Europe, which is uh, the Quebec model is called HQP. This is the, the, those formerly known as graduate students. It's called highly qualified personnel. So the idea is to train students in these new ways of thinking so they can go out to industry, whether that's cultural or, or commercial or even academic, 
uh, and bring these new ways of thinking because, as Georgina Bourne says, these drive different kinds of logics. They drive the logic of innovation, the logic of accountability, but also a logic of ontology, pressing a, a, up against the existing structure and redefining the subjects and objects of research. The last question is how do you attain autonomy within these bureaucratized structures? Um, these, these questions actually seem to be quite bureaucratic, in fact, and governmental, as Foucault might say, and normative, because they don't really capture what artists do. Actually, most artists that I know, including myself when I'm not in the university, uh, don't think of their work making new knowledge. They think of it making experiences um, or events or affects. Um, as as Reinberger, Hans-Jörg Reinberger says, you know, uh, researchers don't start with a question, they actually make something in order to generate a question. So you might think of scientific practice, but also artistic practice as a question generating machine, generating futures. And these kinds of epistemological frames um, ignore something fundamental, which is self-evident in science as well as in art. Um, the fact that making things is actually not a rational, altogether uh, decision-driven activity, but it's bound to all sorts of accidents and failures and misunderstood situations, resource limitations, and misused technologies. Of course, that happens in sciences as well, but you expunge or purify, as Latour says, those things when you write a scientific paper. You may talk about the errors an experiment created, but you don't talk about the failure of the experiment. And artists don't talk about failure either. When you read accounts of artistic work in lots of people's PhDs or in their books, it's as if the project magically worked from the start, which everybody knows is completely wrong. Um, so Reinberger says that if research is on the border of the unknown and the known, um, it entirely depends on how you set up the experimental apparatus. That is, you can say that art making, like scientific research, constructs the future that will not be predictable in advance. So the thing I want to argue is that research creation uh, and its outcomes actually may be similar in some ways to scientific research experimentation, but not in the manner of imitating or copying it or representing it. Right? Experimentation takes its materials or entities as active, dynamic, and changeable, rather than passive, inert, and immutable. And that's experimentation in any field, whether it's biology, physics, uh, chemistry, uh, uh, sociology, or, um, or visual art. Um, and this kind of experimental life transforms these materials into agents that have effects in the world. Experimentation is actually its description and invention at the same time. Its truth claims are judged by its effects, what it makes and uh, what it makes with and through the agencies it works with. So, as, as Reinberger says, you know, experimentation is like a matter of setting up an experimental situation, the initial conditions, and then allowing those initial conditions to produce results that may not be seen in advance. That's the ideal we always want to get to in the experimental life. Okay, so for the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a sense of what it's like to be inside the scientific laboratory as an artist. Facilities and equipment spread between the PC2 lab and an adjoining non-containment, non-hazardous materials lab. We first go back and forth as Yanat inventories the materials and instruments necessary for the tissue culture work. Laminar flow or sterile hood, incubator, water bath, centrifuge, freezers and refrigerators, hemocytometers, inverted microscopes, cryo storage containers, sterilization facilities, cell culturing flask and containers, pipettes and pipette dispensers, syringes and needles, media and serum, the bio waste container, and last but not least, the cells themselves. The first thing we do, quote, is very simple. We want to get some cells and thaw them and put them into the nutrient media to give them all the things they need and hope for the best, unquote. As we ex exit the lab and move down the hall into the room of minus 80 degree centigrade freezers, that's one of them, I have a palpable sense of excitement at finally getting to meet those, quote, cantankerous cells, those bits of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus that have caused our engineering collaborators so much grief in their attempt to design magic tools. Naturally, what we retrieve from these frozen depths will be microscopic and most certainly far from the visceral shock of a final biologically fantasized artwork, but the anticipation builds nonetheless. 
We open one of these minus 80 degree freezers where we extract a blue circular container affectionately dubbed by the scientists as Mr. Frosty from the ice-coated bottom shelf. Standing in for Mr. Frosty's professional but far glamorous pseudonym is cryogenic freezing container, a plastic apparatus holding the tiny vials that will make the long trip between the freezer and the lab more than once during their adventure of being woken to life. As Ionat takes the tiny plastic vials and begins warming them in her hands, like conducting a seance for the dead, I naively ask what is in those vials, thinking that it is some kind of solution that we will use in our defrosting process. Surprised, she turns to me with a smile, quote, life in my hands, unquote. For all my anticipation, I somewhat facetiously admit that I had expected something grander than minute plastic tubes filled with partially crystallized matter. This certainly seems a far cry from what biologist Robert Hooke described in 1650 when, when staring at a slice of cork under a microscope, he named the cell. Um, Hooke's inspiration came not from the intricate membrane-enclosed entities he glimpsed, glimpsed through crude microscopy, but from the Latin word cellula, denoting the isolated chambers that monks inhabited. After Hooke's original naming and almost simultaneously the Dutch inventor of the microscope, Anton Leeuwenhoek's observation of protozoa and bacteria dubbed affectionately in his arguments the Royal Society as, quote, very living little animacules, unquote, theorization of the cell was essentially to remain dormant until the mid-19th century. In 1838, I'm sorry, 1838, the German botanist Matthias Schlieden and his zoologist friend Theodor Schwann invented the discipline we now call cell theory with their singular and powerful argument that the cell was the basic unit of living matter. If Schwann extended Schlieden's theory that all plants were constructed of cells to animals, another German scientist, the polymath Rudolf Virchow, added the essential final step to the doctrine of cell theory, that cells can only be derived from other cells, or ominous cellula a cellula. That cell theory was in first entangled in instruments of observation rather than the sciences of physical chemical matter fits squarely into Georges Canguillem's arguments in his essay on the topic that cell theory should, quote, be considered a collection of protocols of observation, unquote. The arm, arm, eye armed with the microscope sees microscopic life as composed of cells just as the naked eye sees macroscopic life as making up the biosphere, unquote. That's from Kangiem. Kangiem, of course, wrote this long before Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helical strands of DNA in the 1950s that not only extended the role of the cell, but finally explained Virchow's statement, how living cells produced other living cells. This sense of understanding living stuff by virtue of the protocols of observation adds to the unresolved tensions that one explicitly feels during the encounter between the human manipulator and living matter through the process of cell culturing between life that can only be analyzed and tweaked by way of 19th century instruments of observation that Jonathan Crary described, and life articulated and shaped through the physical chemical process that constitutes culturing practices. Yet we are using cell lines, immortal cancerous cells purchased from industrial scale tissue banks that unlike cells derived from primary tissue can endlessly proliferate. Although the most famous of cell lines, the HeLa, was extracted from a human, the African-American woman Henrietta Lacks, who died of cervical cancer in the 1950s, the particular one we will ultimately come to know is derived from non-humans, the skeletal muscle cells uh, tissue of mice whose thigh muscles were crushed in order to simulate the effects of dystrophy. Named C2C12 by David Yaffe and Oral Saxel, now Fuchs, the two Israeli researchers who isolated and derived the line, skeletal muscle cells, or myoblasts, undertake an unusual plan of action in their course of development, what is termed myogenesis. Okay, so this is the process. The cells first need to be nourished in medium, supplemented with fetal calf serum. That's, of course, the blood from little calves. After around 24 hours, the cells begin to proliferate or divide, yielding increasingly amount, uh, increasing amounts of mononucleated, i.e. single nucleus cells in the tissue flask. As the cells reach a certain level of concentration or confluency, they begin to perform cell fusion, literally linking up with their neighbors to form long fibrous strands that are multinucleated but still single, called, single cells called myotubes. So the cell moves from a singular myoblast to a, to a multinucleated but still single cell entity called a myotube, which looks like a kind of sausage, like 
form. Here the cells undergo radical organization and molecular chemical transformations as molecules precisely structure themselves together in order that the core proteins myosin and actin that enable muscle contraction and expansion do their work. Returning to the lab, as Eonot carefully places the vials onto the floor of the sterile hood in order to prepare another pipette to extract the cells and move them to a tissue flask for feeding, I get a quick demonstration of how fragile life literally is by watching how the powerful recirculating air in the hood blows over the vials. The feeding ritual that follows is as abstracted as the rest of the procedure. Enot sucks the cells, perhaps millions, from the vial with the pipette and dispenses them in a not quite nonchalant fashion into the tissue flask. Those are the flasks there, as you can see. Once again, the material consistency of life takes me aback. This time, a kind of smectic blob that appears more like dishwashing detergent than the complex molecular organization of membrane, organelles, and protoplasm that makes up the standard micros macroscopic image of the cell found in biology textbooks. The, for the foamy substance that makes its way up the pipette reminds us, as Peter Sloterdijk articulates in his Mammoth Sphären trilogy, that foam constitutes the prima materia, the generative substance that is at once both fragile and life-giving. Dispensing the foamy cells into the tissue flask, Enot changes the pipette again. What incredible waste. Proceeding to add 15 milliliters of previously mixed medium. In the upright flask, the reddish, reddish color of the medium blends with the foamy but now completely invisible cells, barely a quarter full. Picking up the flash, she moves to the incubator behind and rapidly places the container on the gleaming stainless steel shelf, all the while explaining that the cells are unhappy because they have been moved back and forth between the freezer and the bath, frozen between different states and contexts, half awake and then half suspended in a nebulous underworld of continuously changing thresholds. We have to make them warm. For the moment, I'm taken aback by this anthropomorphic use of language. From what appears before us, for all we know, we could be looking at red dishwashing liquid and not life itself. I make a quick note of this statement as Inot cleans the surface of the hood, turns off the light, and shuts the hood that's it for today. Two, affects and instruments. Later in the week, Enot arranges that we meet Gavin, a young physiology professor with expertise in skeletal muscles whose lab specializes in two kinds of measurement, force and visualization of how those forces affect the length and structure of muscle tissue. In contrast to the clinically sterile tissue culture and molecular biology labs we have been working in, Gavin's cluttered space in the decaying physiology building immediately feels different, more chaotic, and chock-a-block with scientific instruments in a bewildering variety of shapes, sizes, and functions. Looking more like an analog electronic music studio than a life science lab, with cables and wires strewn about and emerging out of various nondescript but expensive looking black and white boxes, Gavin takes us through a show and tell of the apparatuses lurking about the space. And when I gave this talk, when Gavin was present, he started laughing out loud, hysterically, that someone could see his lab as in a music studio. Um, well, that's a class, the classic Latour stranger position. Since his research involves a precision-based focus on single or multiple muscle cells and fibers, or tendons, he states, because the limited amount we have to do research these days, he has purchased an expensive array of measuring devices from precision instrument manufacturers like Aurora Scientific in order to experiment on different scales of muscle physiology. As seemingly turnkey solutions integrating mechanics, electronics, sensing control, and data logging, these Aurora devices, and here they are, these are hundreds of thousands of dollars, they're smallish in size, they occupy vast quantities of real estate in his lab. One device, a shiny and heavy in appearance black box with fused components, this, is capable of holding a wide scale of muscle-related tissues from single fibers to larger muscle constructs such as whole rat tendons and diaphragms from sheep. So this is a sensing device that costs $50,000 that basically uh, you can stretch the muscle cells or the, the tendon tissue in between this thing and then it pulls them. With their amalgamation of material, organic, and recording-based components, Gavin's measuring devices parallel historian of science Henning Schmidgen's argument that machines utilized in the life sciences are not simple instruments, but indeed, quote, a transversal coupling of body and technology of human beings, technological objects, and recording surfaces, unquote. 
Schmidtgen's work in the experimental identification of life reminds us that the history of experimentation in biology cannot be separated from its machinic frame. Yet unlike Hermann von Holmholtz's experiments measuring, measuring the neural impulses of frog legs or the Dutch experimental physiologist Franciscus Dunder's contraption for recording the temporal propagation, the Zeitmessung or time measurement of human neural firings, the recording system used basically render time into graphemic marks and traces. Our bioreactor aims to shift the emphasis from measurement to sensation. From the instrument understood as a semiological apparatus producing written traces of action to one of operating in the perceptual effective realm directly on the bodies and senses of the observer. Of course, Gavin's um, machines cannot escape the coupled pervasiveness of measurement with writing. As he shows us with the depicted uh, twitches, I'm trying to find this, of micro motion, an FFT generated sonogram visualizing the changes of a single muscle fiber's sarcomere length, his mathematical plot, there it is, confirms Jonathan Stern's assertion in the audible past that historically, non-visible temporal phenomena like acoustic vibrations materialized on and through Claudine's glass plates had to be quantified and rendered into the realm of the visible in order to be scientifically acceptable as an object of knowledge. As Gavin explains the ways in which his instruments actuate and measure muscle actions, I return to the question that's continued to obsess me the entire time. What kind of temporal behavior in the muscle res results from actuating it, either by chemical, electrical, or mechanical stimulation? What can we make demonstrable and felt to a spectator in a gallery? With electrical stimulation, a normal cell contracts within 100 milliseconds and relaxes in about 150 milliseconds. But when the question of periodic or stochastic movement arises, Gavin projects it back onto the machine. A 20 to 80 hertz electrical stimulus can be very electrically varied over time and will clearly affect the action of the muscle. Once the actuation force is applied, the fiber will respond and remain latent until the next response. In other words, it seems that stimulating an exogenous does not cause the muscle tissue to store up energy and then indefinitely produce motion. Realizing that we've perhaps taken too much of this researcher's limited amount of time, we quickly return to the discussion of technical nitty gritty, particularly the question of sensing and measuring. What kind of device do we need to be able to sense these baffingly small motions? Once again, Gavin excitedly turns to the machine. So he always turns to the machines when he asks his questions. Well, this machine can do this, this machine can do that. These, these machines, these transducers, are so delicate and expensive they have to be continually recalibrated and certainly could never withstand the, tours, the rigors of touring a work around a museum or a festival around the world. Each device combines electrical, chemical, and mechanical procedures for sensing, actuation, and measuring, solution and buffer, buffer baths, exposed clamps and chambers that enable the researchers to stretch and prod individually dissected fibers. Unlike cultural producers, Gavin setups expose cells to the brutality of the non-sterile world reducing their usable lifespan to more than a few hours. In fact, as Gavin explains, it is the interface between the biological and the instrumentation itself that is really the challenge in this research." Unquote. So what then to make of Gavin and indeed Schmidgen's coupling of body and technologies, of human beings, technological objects and instruments, recording surfaces and hybrid life forms that haunts this strange science fiction project? called tissue engineered muscle actuators. What is it about such a project that makes it somehow so unfathomable to think from a concrete material position on the one hand and on the other makes it so imminently thinkable, practical? What does one capture and how the hybrid working process of a project so enrolled and saturated by techno-scientific practices, instruments, procedures, which wholeheartedly blur and hybridize distinctions between organic and non, living and non, and generate complex amalgams of technical, social, cultural, and material action, uh, semiotic actions. That's, of course, Donna Haraway's thinking about science. Although the new material turn appears to be a radical step in bringing discourses on materiality into the humanities and social sciences, discussion of material agency had the root in epistemological battles fought in the trenches of philosophy of science and later STS starting from the mid-1970s. Indeed, from Latour and Woolgar's pioneering ethnographic study laboratory life, material studies of scientific knowledge have traditionally privileged the domain of scientific practices, along with what Peter Gallison called the material conditions of the laboratory. 
In Image and Logic, Gallison famously argued, quote, the manner in which the machines of physics, lowly instruments, laboratory machines, command our attention if they are understood as dense with meaning, not laden with direct functions only, but embodying strategies of demonstration, work relations in the laboratory and material and symbolic conventions and connections. Gavin's machines in his lab cannot escape the coupled pervasiveness of measurement with writing, echoing the famous Latourian dictum that if you want to know about what science is, look at the inscription devices. Yet according to historian of science Davis Baird, Latour's transformation of the material conditions of the laboratory and indeed scientific practice into reading and writing is a travesty. Indeed, instruments themselves in their material formations and conditions, quote, bear knowledge, unquote, on their subjects, transforming them, and in many cases, bringing them into being. In his work on thing knowledge, Baird argues that scientific instruments are not all the same, but have significant epistemological differences, either acting as models, so Watson and Crick's stick and ball model of DNA, as devices that perform, i.e. produce material transformations in the world, or as measuring systems that produce performances in order to create representations, for instance, like the thermometer or a device that measures the tension of, of a set of cells. By focusing on instruments that do not represent, but rather create phenomenal material changes in the world, Baird's argument aligns with Pickering's notion of the performative idiom of science, one which departs from the idea that science produces representational forms of knowledge that aim and it appears correspondences or mirrors to reality and instead grapple with other kinds of material agencies. Matter, quote, writes Pickering, has agency too, precisely in the sense that its actions can make a difference in respect of human scientists, for example, or all of us in our daily lives. Here I'm referring to such actions that make a difference as performances. Performances are what agents do, whether human or non-human, my conviction is we need to move to a performative rather than representational idiom for studying and reflecting on science and being in general. However, if there is a great epistemological and ontological divide between nature and culture, nature and society, then maybe there is another divide in the current materialist debates, a methodological one between practice or praxis, on the ground shop talk or technical work like Mike Lynch talks about, and know-how and ontological pronouncements of symmetry or flattening between things, objects, processes, or other species. So a, con a promising current direction that aims to level the methodological playing field, which lines up everyday practice at the bench or in the studio with more complex social cultural transformations and formulations is known as multi-species ethnography. As Stefan Helmreich and Eben Kirksey wrote in a 2011 edition of Cultural Anthropology, quote, animals, plants, fungi, and microbes once con con confined in anthropological accounts to the realm of zoe, or bear life, that is which is killable, have started to appear alongside humans in the realm of bios, with legibly biographical and polit political lives. Amid sorry, apocalyptic tales about environmental destruction, anthropologists are beginning to find modest examples of biocultural hope writing of insect love, of delectable mushrooms that flourish in the aftermath of ecological destruction, of microbial cultures enlivening the politics and values of food. Ethnographers are studying the hosts of organisms whose lives and deaths are linked to human social worlds. With their emphasis on living with rather than splitting asunder the human and non-human other, multi-species ethnographies aim toward a more inclusive study and theorization of interactions. That's, of course, emerging a term between Haraway and Berard in which different species entanglings bring about mutual becomings that go beyond singular essences. But what about this quasi-object, these muscle tissues that blur the lines between zoe and bios and techne, which are deeply enrolled as forms of life that involve the manipulation and transformation of life, which is as such contingent and subject to change and transformation? These forms of life encompass the cultural and ethical knowledge of, uh, context of knowledge in the laboratory, its technologies and instruments, its discursive practices that legitimate certain forms of knowledge, the apparatuses of capture initiated and shaped by status, political, social, and financial structures like research funding and similar. Can multi-species ethnographies thus bridge the ontological divide not only between humans and non, but also among biological, material, and technical forces? Or do we not need a more exclusive and tangled ethnography, which may, in the end, resemble more of a tower of Babel comprised of accidents, failures, confusions, breakdowns, and crisscross forces and effects pulsating and resonating through all sorts of bodies, instruments, settings, and apparatuses, than a dialogue that speaks in the name of our biological, technical, human, others. So do we need a dialogue or do we need an entangling? 
One more minute and I'm done. Since the cells have been incubating for several days in the new serum, we desperately scan for signs of life while carefully repositioning the various tissue flasks across the microscope's specimen holder and extension plate, searching for the faintest bits of motion. So here we're trying to see if the cells are moving after days and days. Stasis, unending stasis, greets us at each flask. Utilizing our naked eyes as opposed to the pixelated representations of the monitor to our left, here, here, okay. We squint hard into the eyepiece, almost to the point where the pressure against the eye produces phosphines, creating phantom movement. At the cusp of giving up, I readjust the flask on the plate from a region of cells that appear to be so static they could be frozen to each other. Suddenly, I fall upon an almost divine sense of fluctuation among the cells, a kind of glorious twitching in which mass clusters of intertwined myotubes pulse in indeterminate rhythms. Coursing like the flow of blood from the ventricles of the heart, this movement produces a swishing jerkiness, not necessarily periodic, but not without pattern. It suggests to me something like the heartbeat that appears in an early ultrasound of a fetus still nestled within the womb. Readjusting the flask again in order to glance at a new region, the movement appears to now spread across the myotube mesh, throbbing like the living ocean glimpsed in the final shot of Tarkovsky's film Solaris. At first, I think the movement is an illusion, the byproduct of wishes projected onto these coiled, sausage-like forms. Upon glancing again and again, however, the movement appears very real indeed. Excitedly, I let my secret out to the world. You're not, they're moving, they're moving. She quickly drops what she is doing and runs to the microscope to capture the evidence. A slightly latent but still excited scream pierces the sterile air-blown silence of the lab. Ah, they're moving. We don't know how long and for how, but this movement is somehow a kind of temporal telos for our work over the past weeks. We rush with the singular flash to Cell Central's time-lapse microscope to begin the recording of these exquisite contractions and expansions, both as images to prove that movement is not imagined, as well as to see how long the cells will maintain this motility. I exaggerate this movement of discovery and this moment to depict the sudden and palpable experience of something that up to now has remained abstract. This bundle of cells resembles no machine. For how could a machine be glimpsed over weeks transforming not only its appearance, moving from singular to multiple, but also its potential? Even though the cells only twitch for a day or so, the moment of motion experience is not the disappearance of potentiality and the realization of actuality, but instead the catalyst for its, regenerous, uh, for its regenesis. Thanks. Thank you very, mu very much. I think it was amazing. Uh, the conference was highlighting, your presentation was highlighting key questions that arises in a, con in a congress like this, like uh, research, materiality, art, um, effects, effects, politics, poetics. So I think you were going through all these <laughs> things like in a very, very uh, performative way. and fascinating <laughs> way. So I think we can open now the discussion. Uh, for sure, there's a couple of things <laughs> to say. Okay. Good morning and thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, two uh, questions which come out of a necessary simplification, and I hope that it's not too cartoonish. Would it be okay to say that you're trying to produce the simplest actor, the simplest possible actor? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, is there something related to gender in thinking that that simplest possible actor is a muscle, and so an actuator, mm -hmm. and not a sensor? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I would say no, it's not the simplest possible actor. It's one of many actors. Um, because if you, if, you take the, if you take an analysis from someone like Gilbert Simondon, um, life doesn't exist in, in the organism, right? So this is this whole interesting thing about this project. Where is life? It's more like ask the question, how is life and when is life? What context is it? Because you can say, well, of course life is in the cell, but because what tissue culture does is actually produce cells in a completely artificial environment, and this is also very recent practice, it's only as old as the early part of the 20th century, the end of 19th century, um, 
you can say, well, you know, the cells are only as good as the medium they're in, right? And the medium is contained within a tissue flask, so the flask protects that. So you say, well, of course, life is inside this, you know, milieu, as Simondon says, as a milieu socié, where in, there's a causality going on between the cells and the, and the, and the, and the milieu itself, and those co-produce each other. But then you can say, well, oh, okay, but the actors are then that, that constellation. You say, well, yeah, but that constellation, it has to be in a sterile environment. So then you say, what's well, in the incubators? The incubator's there, okay? So now you say the incubator's part of an actor. So now you start to have a scaling problem, right? And then you can say, well, the incubator's in the lab. And Simon Don does this analysis of the object, you know, he says the element, the object, and the ensemble. The ensemble is like the lab. It keeps extending out in the world. So where, where is life in this question? That, that's a weird question to ask because, in fact, you can't point to it. You can only say it's part of an environment in which these different actors are taking place. And that actually is a move away from a Latour discourse of a network, which is a problematic term, not only because it, you know, as he's even said it resembles computer networks, but in fact it's about differences, right? It's about points in a network in which there are differences, and these differences essentially are, are kind of counting systems, right? So you change this, this thing changes. And, but it, it assumes that those things are somehow separate, that there are all these actors or these actants are separate entities. And of course the word actant, right, is, is to design to, re, to remove gender from it. The second question is about gender. Um, and that's a very, very interesting question because, uh, and it's been invoked a lot, obviously, in, in, in science studies uh, on precisely this critique of this degendered notion of, of the actant, right? And, uh, and, and Karen Barad, for instance, has critiqued uh, Pickering for removing gender from his performative notion of science. Um, I would say again that the gender is is not in the cell, but it's in the it's in you know picking Butler up. You know, it's in the performance. It's the way in which the social frames of how the lab works are constituting gender. So, in fact, um, while we're in the lab in that tissue culture lab, most of the researchers who are doing this very very tedious um, biology based uh, molecular bio or uh, microbiology based work, work are women. And see, so the women come in and they make their notes in the lab and they leave, you know. And, and so it's very interesting this way in which, like, certain kinds of gestures are produced by these researchers in this lab. And then, of course, there's lots of work in this, you know. Um, so I, I would say that the gender, again, is a, is, is, a, is, a, is a question of the, in that case, the social cultural conventions and not in the, in the thing itself. So. Other, other questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, I would like to make a question, more philosophical one, not mm -hmm. in terms of your work, but uh, you have been talking about running an experiment, or you know, but uh, sometimes I see more an experience than an experiment there. So yeah. in this sense, uh, so that was my first question. Um, and also the second question would be like, would be something uh, realistic to think that in the near future, artists can do real science in the sense that the science that scientists, scientists understand, and, and, uh, understand as science, and at the same time, uh, would it be something realistic to think that scientists could do some artistic works? Okay. Uh, so the first question on uh, ex uh, experiment versus experience, well, the nice thing about French is you have the term experience, and the term experience means both experience and experiment. So <laughs> that answered that question. No, um, and, and you're right. Yes, I'm writing about an experiment, experience because that's what experiment actually really is. You know? um, we have this assumption that experiment is, I have a hypothesis and I prove it, but 30 years of work in the social studies of science, technology and science tell us that that is actually a misnomer, that in fact, the experiment is the thing that brings about the question we're trying to ask, you know, or, I mean, I, I, of course, Reinberger is one who says that uh, the epistemic object is only come, uh, comes about by doing the experiment. So this old hypothesis theory of doing, you know, you have a theory and then you prove it, uh, actually, people like hacking have taken that apart. The second question is more complex because I, I always want to make tame actually a, a, a distinction between art and science. They're very different practices. They have extremely different intentions. Having worked on projects like this now, not, not just the, in the biology lab, but with engineers, which is also a different kind of, that's techno science, right? Not, not natural science. Um, 
It's very rare that those intentions meet, simply because the epistemic cultures, to use uh, Norse Satina's term, uh, don't meet, right? And then why should they? You know, um, we always talk about art and science, but there's all sorts of other disciplines that art uh, is also doing something really different. Like uh, cooking is, you know, <laughs> and art really don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, anthropology and art don't really have anything to do with each other, although there's more and more attempt to make connections. So I, I'm very much against the kind of fusion of things and, uh, or even say flipping the saying, well, art, now this artist has become a scientist or the scientist become an artist. Uh, when I was at Symbiotica and I was talking to Stuart Hodgetts, who's um, uh, one of the kind of supporters, and he's a molecular biologist, he said, well, you know, you're, you know, you're learning now actual scientific technique. And I said, yeah, but technique is not doing science, right? Because, again, sciencia is knowledge, right? Sciencia is knowledge. Uh, so um, you would assume that by doing science, you're, you, you know, you're, you're, you're pr producing a new kind of knowledge. That's why I said, you know, the question about art producing knowledge, I'm throwing that out there. I'm not, I don't know about that, actually. I, I, if you use the term research in relationship to art, you have to address that question. But it's a very thorny question to answer um, because the relation between knowledge and experience is not binary, but actually more entangled than we think it is. But it's not very easy um, and, and students aren't taught uh, to, to think about, you know, making something as a knowledge-making practice, you know, in terms of artistic practice. So um, I, I, I would say that those areas are still quite, quite separate. And um, there are times when collaborations happen that are mutually beneficial to both parties. Uh, and, and, and in that way, the, the, the notion of transdisciplinary that Michael Gibbons gives is a useful one. He says that if you have a transdisciplinary project, uh, you have a mutual interpenetration of different disciplines so that ownership breaks down. Now, this is a political question, right? It's that if you are collaborating with somebody with an institutional setting, and in, in research settings are institutionals, right, in institutions, then when those things merge, who can say this is mine? So the challenge actually, as Georgina Bourne and Andrew Perry say, is, is an ontological challenge to how you do something, not what you make, but how you do it. That's where the real force of interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary projects happen, and that's extremely, extremely rare to see. So. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, Pal has a question. Good. <laughs> it's been a great talk. Yeah, you have talked about almost everything that we we we, uh, we have been dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the um, questions that I've been been trying to to solve or to think about. Uh, through all the conference and also the seminars that we've been doing. And, uh, well, the question is that, okay, um, uh, let's say the um, STS approach, uh, new materialism approach, uh, Karen Barrett's approach, it changed the image of science and the image of what it means to, to, to construct knowledge. No? Yeah. And this, of course, is also, as you have <laughs> shown, effects of uh, what it means to do um, what's the mean, what, what is the art in the making from this perspective? What, what does it mean, uh, the, the art in the making from this perspective? No? So that means, in other ways, raising some ontological distinctions that highly, uh, deeply rooted in the uh, other modern society, modern way of, of looking at things, no? which, uh, for example, uh, universities are based upon, <laughs> upon that, and, and uh, school pro um, uh, university programs uh, with disciplines and yeah. knowledge are based on that. Yeah. So I'm just uh, wondering about what you have just, uh, the last part of, of what you have uh, just um, answered about the education about that. What it means to, um, what would it mean um, to um, to start from this uh, from this starting point, from this change, uh, radical change of perspective, of what, of what it means to uh, this this science, uh, this new uh, uh, image, uh, this, this new image of science, and and what it means to to construct and uh, knowledge based on this community and all, all this. Um, just. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my God. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, the, the issue is, as you say, around epistemic cultures, right? And, and you know, the, these, these cultures are, they don't, they're not given, right? They, they come about through all sorts of different types of historical and cultural and financial economic um, prerogatives uh, and relationships. And then suddenly you have a discipline. So science and technology studies is a perfect example, or performance study, all these studies, you know, are very interesting examples, but they're, because they, they, they arise based on people from different disciplines who in fact realize that they have a common boundary object between them, you know, uh, and it's not their discipline, it's something bigger than their discipline. And so then they form these interdisciplinary clusters that then become disciplines, right, because the academy wants to, you know, people want to create careers so it's the same in art, you know, you have to publish within a certain field or you have to be known as a certain artist doing a certain kind of thing and then you have that tag on you and, you know, and so then there's a, and there's a legitimate, just as in, in, in scientific practice, art has all of its own gatekeepers and, and thought communities as well, right? Curators and, and, and museum directors and, find, and, gal and, and um, grant bodies and all of these things. So, um, so, but I, what I see more and more in my own students is that is is this desire to, to to cross over, you know, and in fact to to deal with kind of clusters, you know. So it's like, okay, I I'm doing, you know, I have one. I have one PhD student who's trained as an engineer, but he's moved more into these kinds of question game types of questions. And so he has to know something about sociology, you know, but he can't study the whole field of sociology in four years, you know. So this kind of expertise of a deep knowledge of a single field happens more and more that there's a cluster in which there's a slice of deep knowledge, but not a breadth of knowledge within that field. And out of that then come const constructs of new kinds of fields, you know, in a way, uh, or practices. It's the same as this idea of research creation. Um, is it a discipline? Is it a method? Or is it a field? You know, uh, is it a field of knowledge in which these different, different kinds of knowledge come together uh, and which then you have a kind of expertise in? So, um, you know, we, I think we, 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 ship, we move out of an old model in which one is trained in a single discipline over a long period of time. At the same time, uh, I'm very much uh, believe in the idea of expertise, that you have to be an expert in something. You have to feel grounded in something. So the idea of I've studied interdisciplinarity is total bunk, you know, like, what, do you, what does that mean? You know, it just means you're a master of all trades and a master of not, you're, 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 you know all trades, but you're really not a master of any of them. So in, in some ways you have to establish like I, I'm grounded in something and then you can start to say, okay, how, how do these other fields change that? So for instance, I have an architect, um, PhD student right now, who's challenging, and she's trained as an architect, and she's worked as an architect, she's also worked as a curator. She's trying to challenge architecture, and she asked the question, um, why is it that, does architecture export its ideas out to other disciplines, so it can affect those disciplines with architectural thought? Or is it that some architects and import other disciplines in order to change architecture, you know? And that's a really interesting question, because are you inside the discipline trying to affect its change within, or are you trying to send its frames of reference and its models of knowledge making out to other, other practices, you know? So I think that's the thing we're constantly, the specificity of what you're trying to do when you start to engage in crossing over into other practices is really important. At the same time, yeah, I mean, I went to the, so at the AAA, at the American Anthropological Association meeting last weekend, they're all talking about these issues. They're, these are anthropologists. They're all talking about materiality and, and questions of experience, and, and not all of them, but a big percentage of, of them. And at the same time, in the, in the talks, everyone is, has an agreed upon set of ways of doing something, right? They know what ethnography is and they can make jokes of each other, with each other about how the, you know, you know, going a little bit over here and more radical and, but they're still grounded in, the, in, in that particular field. Um, 
So, you know, the universities are moving very slowly uh, to try to embrace programs and, and, and teachers or professors who, who can integrate, you know, but not necessarily throw out existing disciplines, you know. So this question of integration, of being able to see how the effect of one f uh, question in one field crosses over into another field is, is the kind of skills people are trying to develop, and I think are, are starting to develop, you know. So it's, it's groundedness at the same time, it's understanding that, hmm, that question, that question could be interesting to these people over there. So for instance, for, for me personally, I'm not trained as an anthropologist. I mean, I studied anthropology as an undergraduate and taken lots of classes, but I didn't major in it, right? So I didn't study anthropology all the time. But I've worked with anthropologists, and you start to realize, oh, some of the questions that you're asking, those anthropologists want to know about those things too. So then you try to say to an anthropologist, look, I'm, I'm thinking about this. This is grounded in how you're thinking. Let's see if we can work together and see if there's some kind of trade or you know, transfer of, of, of knowledge. But the thing is the transfer of knowledge is transformed in the process, right? Because I'm not producing what David Howe's anthropologist thinks is, is traditional anthropological knowledge. I'm doing something else. And so he then starts to put it in his own frame of reference, and he's going to write about it in his own field. And, but because of me, his way of thinking is shifted. And because of him, my way of thinking is shifted. So, but we're still, you know, I'm still not saying I'm becoming an anthropologist. You know, I'm still an artist uh, doing, you know, treading over into the anthropological territory. So I think you see more and more of that. Um, and that means you have to require, it's a lot of work, basically. It's a lot of work to not master other fields, but to realize I have to learn enough about this field in order that I'll be taken seriously in it. Okay, if there's no more, more questions, we can close here. We are almost half an hour ahead to the schedule, so I think it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was very inspiring, so I think it's a very good start point for, the day, for today. Uh, thank you. Thank you.